Daniel is an awesome book. It is rich. It is so full. Joanne gets a kick out of it when I say scripture is rich. You know it is. It is just so full, and you can go on and on and on and study for a lifetime and never begin to approach the things of God. We try, make an effort. He helps us get there, but there's so much that's just beyond us. But let's take a shot at it this morning. So today we're going to be looking at Daniel chapter 3, verses mm -hmm. 14 through 26. And the lesson had a title, and this is what they said. Believers must stand for God regardless of the potential cost. When was the first time you read uh, in Daniel or heard the story about Daniel and the three young men being in the furnace? It was probably in Sunday school when you were three or four years old. Yeah. Uh, I can remember that story way back then. <clears throat> And I can remember even then, it got my attention. Would I be willing to obey God and give my life? Or would I be more likely to disobey God, go my own world, and forget about those things that I know to be true? So let me ask you this morning a really hard question. If you were put in that position today, um, no hands, no answers. This is just rhetorical. What do you think you would do? Where would your allegiance be? And the lesson talked a lot about allegiance this week, or it did in my book anyway. So where would you be? What kind of a choice would you make? Would it be difficult for you? Maybe not so difficult. I'm thinking that if you've got to give your life, that that would be a tough one. I'm thinking that would be a tough one. You need the help of the Holy Spirit. You remember when ISIL or ISIS <laughs> was uh, wreaking havoc throughout the Middle East, Syria and Iraq and thereabouts. And there were a number of people who died just because they were Christians. So you might think, not in this day and time, but yeah, happens in this day and time. There are things that happen in this country where people have made a choice recently within the last three years, actually within the last two years. God, God's <coughs> way, or man's way, the world. So where would you come down? How does a person's faith find expression and loyalty? We owe God our loyalty, do we not? Gave his son for us. We talked about that last week. What great love. How can we not be loyal to God? How did the actions of the accusers, do you remember those accusers, those Chaldeans, maliciously, um, they, in their way, opened the door for those men to have to make a hard choice. Same thing happens today. So how would that affect your life? If you're put in a position, again, I would ask you to consider, what would you do? What would be your answer? How would you behave in that situation? Why do you think that we ought not be surprised at all of this? That happened over 2,600 years ago, almost 2,700 years ago. And again, in this day and time when we're so sophisticated, how could that happen today? So I want to ask you, tell me, how could it happen today? How could it happen to you? How could it happen in the city of Leesburg? How do you think? Jesus said, 
you will have suffering in this world. He didn't say that you're just going to have suffering 2,000 years ago or 2,600 years ago or 3,000 or 5,000. He said, you'll have suffering in this world. So that means today and tomorrow. But he went on to say, be courageous. I think so, I'm sorry, go ahead. In our public school system, mm -hmm. this is very real. And you're seeing the change happen quickly. Um, and just a couple things that when you talk about needing to be had, even with our own kids going through high school, the school shootings um, and the like, um, I'll be an example. And then in regards to this world and the change, um, the LGBTQ society is becoming very, very strong in our public school system. Um, I think it would shock you if you went to school with me um, in the public school setting. Um, you would have an eye opener. I have one every day. And um, it's it's becoming very hard. And it's yeah. just a little piece of the realness. Mm. Oh. I hear you. And yeah, it's not going to get any better. No. But Jesus said, again, be courageous. He went on to say, I have conquered the world and we know we did that's in john 16 33 and later jesus went on in matthew 28 he said remember remember i am with you always to the end of the age he didn't say i'm going to be with you now you know words have meanings and language is important and sometimes we read over these things if we don't if we don't get what he's actually saying we think we do but we miss part of it and this is one of those where it happens. First of all, he says, I am God. I am the first and the last, the beginning and the end. I am God Almighty. And what does it mean in that definition of himself? He is all powerful. He is omniscient. He is omnipotent. He is everywhere. He's in everything. He is all powerful. There is nothing impossible to him. And that's what he says here. I am. And then he goes on to say, with you always today, right now, in the school. And you know that. I know you know that. Wrong. No situation, however hard it may be, that if you belong to Christ, good morning, Donna, that he is not with you. He is with you this morning. So we read these things and we think when we put ourselves in these positions, be a hard decision. You know, giving up, we love our lives. Be a hard decision. But the good news is that Jesus Christ is with us. He's not going to bring us to anything that he's not going to get us through. What did Charles Rossell teach us year after year after year? God will deliver us through or he will deliver us from. And this preacher preaches the same thing, even now. So there is a way out. Now, there's a life principle involved, involved here. When you read Daniel and take the book as a whole. And uh, there are many, but one is obey God and leave all the consequences to him. We do a lot of worrying. And what did Jesus tell us? Worrying is simple and we don't need to do it, but we do it. It's a human condition, but we don't need to. What does scripture say in Exodus 19? Now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all peoples. For all the earth is mine. You will be my treasured possession. The Lord, of course, he was talking specifically to the Israelites there. But we belong to him today. We are his today. And we are his treasured possession. So there is no situation, beloved, that God doesn't have you in his hands. And we talked about that many times. It's easy for me to stand up here and say that. I know, I know some of y'all going through some tough stuff. Have gone through some tough stuff. And we'll continue. You got to target them back if you're a Christian in this world in many different ways. Mm -hmm. But you are God's treasure possession. Think about that, man. Mm -hmm. That is so awesome. You belong to Him and you're important to Him. The hairs of your head are numbered. Scripture goes on to say in Isaiah 30, and your ears, listen to this one. And your ears shall hear a word behind you saying, this is the way. Walk in it. When you turn to the right or when you turn to the left, goes along with the scripture above. 
God will direct our steps when we trust in him with all our heart and we are submissive to him and when our relationship is right to him. So don't be discouraged this morning. Now, today's scripture, Nebuchadnezzar commanded that all of his subjects bow down to the image he had made. Now, first of all, note, he had made or caused that image to be made. And scripture talks about those kind of things. What do the commandments say with respect to a man's relationship with God and things like this? What are the first three commandments? Who can tell me? Somebody got that right on top of the head. They're going to live and back there, raise his hand up immediately. Go ahead, Lee. That's right. He said, I am the Lord your God who brought you up out of Egypt. Make no graven images. Don't take my name in vain. There is a very important relationship that we are commanded to keep with God. This Nebuchadnezzar made an image. What were those young men going to do? They had no choice. Now, the statue which the king arrogantly made represented himself, most likely. You remember he had a dream previously in chapter 2, and Daniel had described to him the dream that God had given him, and he was the head who's made all of gold. Well, he took it a step further and made the entire image out of gold. It was probably gold-plated. But whatever it may have been, whether gold-plated or solid gold, he made it and it was his lifting himself up. What an evil thing. The word for image in scripture usually means a human form. So that's why folks think it was a, uh, in human form or scholars. The height was 90 feet by nine feet. That was a pretty, pretty good size statue. Nebuchadnezzar was establishing his kingdom. And that was why he had all the officials come. And Daniel, no, excuse me, not Daniel, but the three young men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, got caught up in that. Um, you remember from last week that Daniel had resolved in his heart not to be defiled with the king's food and wine. These young men had obviously made a similar resolution with respect to God's commandments, obeying God, living for God. Now, as we talked about, some of the folks out there today think that this world is more benevolent today than it was then, and as we've already talked about. I can tell you from my personal experience, I expect you to say the same thing. The world is not that benevolent. I've not been anywhere where I would label that place as being really benevolent. Most places I've been, if there are churches, they're emptying out. They're turning them into museums. There are fewer and fewer Christians. Now, that part's depressing, but that Jesus has overcome the world is encouraging. Now, let's read uh, a little bit of the scripture today. So, in verse 14, Nebuchadnezzar answered and said to them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the golden image that I have set up? Now, you know that... He had set up the golden image and he commanded all to bow and worship his gods and his image uh, at the playing of the music. And they didn't do it. And so the malicious Chaldeans <laughs> told them. And so now they're in front of Nebuchadnezzar. He had been furious at them because they didn't bow down. Why do you think he knew them? They had done some pretty incredible things. He'd examined them three years ago or more and knew what caliber of young men they were. They were good young men and they benefited him. And they benefited that kingdom, the Babylonian kingdom. Why do you think he would have become so angry? Scripture notes several different places where he becomes very, very angry. He's known these men now for 20 years. This is a 20 year period from the time he began to deal with them until now it's 20 years. He has 20 years of experience knowing who these men are, but all of a sudden he's forgotten who they are. And what they stand for. Why do you think he did that? That's what I'm asking. Well, he's, he's, he's a man that has the sin nature in him. He's, he's against anything that, that God's for, and uh, he can't help himself. And uh, my opinion is that uh, uh, it's the way of the world today. Uh, you take our rulers that are in charge of the United States of America today, none of them are born again Christians. You couldn't be a born again Christian and be 
abortion and all the things that they stand for. You could not be a Christian. You could not be. So they have to be. And this never and as it was just like them. <laughs> I think it goes back to uh, he commands all peoples, nations, and men in every language that they bow down. So that was a unification thing. He wants everybody to be together. <coughs> when you force unification, it causes division. And he but like for 16 years or 20 or whatever, he's known these men. <laughs> They had no contact with their Jerusalem or their home or the people. So he's thinking in his heart that he has changed them by now, that they are going to be like him and his nation. I think he's curious because it failed. Mm -hmm. And why? Perhaps he did. Yeah. Right. Mickey, how you doing? He's full of pride, this, right, right. this guy. He is, he is only thinking of himself and all that he's built and all that he's done. And he wants recognition. And so he's really messed up. He took the time to create a God or an image, excuse me, and that someone wouldn't bow down before. I think you're exactly right. I think along with these other things yeah. that he was pride filled. What happens when we puff ourselves up? And we expect other people to go along with our notions. We we don't like to hear no, do we? He didn't like to hear no that 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 period of time when that was going on. And he became furious. It's interesting that he became furious at these young men, but scripture says he did several times. The king, he seemed to forget all that had gone before. Now let's be reminded just a moment. If you go back to chapter two, this is what he had said to Daniel and about Daniel and of Daniel when Daniel interpreted this dream. And I'm going to begin reading from 246, and I'm going to read fast so you don't have to worry. Then King Nebuchadnezzar fell upon his face and paid homage to Daniel, paid homage to Daniel, and commanded that an offering and an incense be offered up to him. The king answered and said to Daniel, truly, your God is God of gods and Lord of of lords and it goes on but i want to skip down uh, verse 49 and it says daniel made a request of the king and he appointed shadrach meshach and abednego over the affairs of the province of babylon now here again the king knew them so it's interesting his pride however ruled over everything else if you go on to uh verse 15 it says now if you are ready when you hear the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music to fall down and worship the image that I have made, well and good. But if you do not worship, you shall immediately be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. And who is the God who will deliver you out of my hands? Now, he's, these young men have got a clear choice. Obey Nebuchadnezzar or obey the God of their fathers, their God. Now, as we said, Nebuchadnezzar, he's forgotten that he had honored these young men. He seemed what even worse is to be mocking God. Mm -hmm. Nebuchadnezzar had forgotten what he'd said about the Lord God Almighty, and he is mocking God. That is incredible. I would suggest to you that it's never a good thing to mock God. I would suggest to you that it is a never, excuse me, that it is never good to boast with respect to God Almighty. Unless you're boasting about God, and Nebuchadnezzar wasn't doing that. Going to verse 16. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. Right. If this be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. Do you remember when we were studying Job, uh, we talked about Job 13, 15, and Job said, though he slay me, yet I will trust in him. Essentially, that's what these young men are saying. Same Job did, same attitude, same confidence in God Almighty. God may slay me, but I will trust him. I will serve him. I will honor him. Same display of faith in the face of death. Incredible faith in Almighty God. 
A resolute faith. What's your faith looking like this morning? Faith without compromise. They were not willing to bend their knee to an evil image or to Nebuchadnezzar. Solid rock wow. faith <laughs> built on the rock of our salvation. What scripture say in Isaiah 28? Therefore, thus says the Lord God, behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a tested stone, a costly cornerstone for the foundation, firmly placed. He who believes in it will not be disturbed. And of course, he's talking about Jesus Christ. And we see Jesus a little bit later in this scripture. Do you think, did Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego lack faith that God would rescue them? They weren't presumptuous at all, were they? They made no boast. They didn't carry on about our God will deliver us from no fire. Did not do anything like that. They were very humble, <laughs> even in that. They were very, very humble. So their faith is just a shining faith. Daniel's friends believed that God was able to rescue them. They said that God could choose to deliver them or not, but they trusted in him. They trusted in his sovereignty. They trusted in his choices for their lives. Whether to live or die, they trusted in God. The application this morning is where are you in that? Do you trust in God? Do you trust him in all aspects of your life? Their faith was not limited to God's ability to perform miracles, to do the supernatural. They believed in God unequivocally in every way with a rock solid faith. It's one of the strongest examples, if you look throughout scripture, of a faith in God. Now, it's interesting if you read this scripture, one of the things that I noted, it's interesting in all of their dealings, these young men, plus Daniel, remain respectful to the king. Now, you've got to think of it. That would be a hard thing to do. And why should he's going to throw him in a fire? Why should I be respectful to this guy who's going to kill me? Because I don't believe what he wants me to believe. Why should we be respectful today to our president? or to our elected officials. It's hard to do sometimes, isn't it? God's word says that. So. God's word says so. God put them there. Amen. The scripture says the Scripture says so. yeah. You can't get out of it. We don't want to do it sometimes, but you can't get out of it. But I, I will tell you what, what happens, and it's demonstrated in scripture over and over. When we are respectful as they were, then it has an impact, and it builds bridges. You burn bridges with your attitude, and you're carrying on at other people, your failure to love in all situations, if you burn those bridges, you are going to have a hard time rebuilding them. That's not such an easy thing to do. You keep those bridges in place and things can happen that would not happen otherwise. Mickey? When the uh, media pans <clears throat> the protest, you can sometimes tell which side is life and which side is against life, just by watching the people. I mean, there's an angry side, a hateful side, and then there's a side that is uh, with smiles and joy on their face. Hopefully, doesn't happen all the time, but I think in general, you see it. It's very obvious. Yeah, I think you're right. I think that's that respect that we're talking about. One thing they are is always determined. Their confidence and their faith in God is incredible, as we talked about. As Christians, what I would say to you this morning is that we should follow the example of those young men and be salt in the world. What scripture say in Matthew 5 about y'all as Christians? Jesus said this himself in the Sermon on the Mount. That's right. He said, you are the salt of the earth. You all sitting there right, right this morning. But if the salt loses its saltness, salt in how can it be made salt again? Cannot. Physically impossible. It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. That scripture goes on to say, you are the light of the world. Those young men were the light of the world. If they would have been obnoxious, nasty, burn those bridges, if they'd been anything other than respectful, they would have been very lim limited in what they could have done after God delivered them. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it 
under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others. Let your light shine before others. Why? That they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. That's exactly what Nebuchadnezzar did. He saw what these young men did. He saw what God did for them. And ultimately, a blasphemer, a pagan, <laughs> heathen, no count. No, I'll stop. He had to recognize that God Almighty is God Almighty. He had no choice. And he did recognize it. And the young men helped him. Were you going to say something, Art? Yeah. Um, I... I've been reading almost every day, Psalm 91, and it just came to me um, that they're an example of what was written there where it says, if you say the Lord is my refuge and you make the most high your dwelling, no harm will overtake you. And that for anyone that hasn't really um, read this psalm, it's a, a psalm that really brings a lot of peace. And also, that's a beautiful song, it sure is. Because he loved me, I will save him. That's one of my most favorite scriptures in all the world. Yes, ma'am. Hey, Susan. Um, something I had not thought of before. Um, if you go back to page 78, they, they talk about the, the all four of these guys were given Babylonian names. It's interesting that Daniel, we hear about from his original name. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are their Babylonian names, not their original names. I don't know. Actually, if you, I hear what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. If you read through the entire book of Daniel, you will come across their Hebrew names uh, a couple of times, a couple of three times. But it's interesting. When it is interesting. Yes, fiery furnace, Indeed. Using you're absolutely right. So let me ask you guys, do you think the three young Hebrew Hebrews, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fear Nebuchadnezzar, as they're standing there, they've got this choice. Where was their fear? Of God, yeah. They had a greater fear of God, didn't they? What does scripture say about who we should fear? If you look at Psalm 27 1, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? To fear the Lord is good. Jesus delighted himself in the fear of the Lord. Our hearts are designed in the same way. We should fear the Lord. Isaiah 11. A shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. From his roots a branch will bear fruit. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him. The spirit of wisdom and of understanding. The spirit of counsel and of might. The spirit of the knowledge and fear of the Lord, and he will delight in the fear of the Lord. There's a prophecy by the Lord Jesus, and it speaks of his fear of the Lord. Then look at Psalm 19. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The decrees of the Lord are firm, and all of them are righteous. In the scripture, the entire scripture, there are at least 300 references to the fear of God. Now, we talked about fearing God before, and I know you guys know all that. This morning is a reminder. The fear of God is something that ought always to be in our minds and on our hearts. To truly fear God is a joy and a supreme delight in the way that we should fear him. But it can also be terrifying if you are in sin. It's a fearsome thing to fall into the hands of Almighty God. Romans 3 is a significant chapter on sin that tells us that our chief sin, our chief sin is to have no fear of God. And I'm going to read a little bit from that. What shall we conclude then? Do we have any advantage? Not at all. For we have already made the charge that Jews and Gentiles alike are all under the power of sin. Sit here this morning. Sin is a challenge for us. As it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They have together become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. 
Their throats are open graves, their tongues practice deceit. The poison of vipers is on their lips. Their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Ruin and misery mark their ways in the way of peace. They do not know, but here's the kicker. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now, you're sitting there this morning. I know this doesn't apply to you. I know that you fear God. What I would caution you is to be sure that you do. Remember that you have a responsibility to fear God. He expects that of you, a reverential awe, not a terror that causes you to run away, but a reverential awe <coughs> that draws you near. Psalm 36, 1. Hear this scripture. I have a message from God in my heart. A message from God in my heart concerning the sinfulness of the wicked. There is no fear of God before their eyes. So that's something you got to be mindful of in your lives. When you look at the world today, when you look out around us, when you go out and have lunch, this morning, do you see a fear of God all around you? How are things going to get better if there's not a fear of God? Now, I'm not being cynical nor pessimistic, but what I know is that apart from a fear of God, apart from a love for God, then there's not a lot of hope for this world apart from Jesus Christ. Listen, fear of God will cause you to look to God. To human conditions, the way God made us. If you fear God, you will strive to know him. You will work as hard as you can to get close to him. If you have no fear, then you're not going to be looking. Again, the human condition. Hey, Don. And, and plus, it helps you do the right thing when something might be legal, but it might not be right. You know, mm -hmm. so when you think, okay, is this right with God? You may not do something otherwise that you could get, you could get away with. It. Sure. Yeah. First Chronicles 28. And you, my son Solomon, David was talking to Solomon, acknowledge the God of your father and serve him with wholehearted devotion and with a willing mind. He went on to say, for the Lord searches every heart and understands every desire and every thought. If you seek him, he will be found by you. As long as Solomon saw God, he was good. When he turned away from God, look what happened in his life. It wasn't pretty. If you seek God, you will find it. David said to Solomon, listen my son, I'm saying you today, I'm not here, excuse me, not anymore, David. <clears throat> Seek God. Seek God. If you do, he will be found by you. Goes on to 2 Chronicles 15. He, God's prophet, Azariah, went out to meet King Asa and said to him, listen to me, Asa and all Judah and Benjamin. The Lord is with you when you are with him. If you seek him, he will be found by you. But if you forsake him, he will forsake you. Those young men did not forsake God. That was a hard situation, but they did not forsake God. Most of our lives, we live in situations that are far less challenging than what, and I pray, I hope none of y'all ever have that kind of a choice that you have to make. But we do have choices that come before us on a regular basis in this world. The world will tempt you. The world will put the situation uh, the situations and circumstances in front of you, and you have to make a choice. You choose to do what's right, or you choose to do what's wrong. And it may be okay, legally. You may have an out, might have a loophole. But what should your choice be? Don't forget who you belong to. The scripture goes on to say, talking about King Asa, after the prophet had come to him, they sought God eagerly they did what they were told to do and he was found by them they found him god kept his promise he'll keep his promise to you this morning so the lord this is what the lord did for that king and for the nation of israel and it went on for about 35 years the lord gave them rest on every side you want blessing in your life obey god you want curses in your life? Disobey God. It's a simple choice. 
It's a simple choice. It's not to say you don't have suffering, you don't have hard times. Of course we do. You belong to the Lord, it's going to happen. But the Lord gave them peace, mm -hmm. gave them rest on every side. The godly men of the Bible, we read about, we know about, they feared God. Joseph was a God-fearing man. On, in Genesis 42, it says, on the third day, Joseph said to them, do this and you will live, for I fear God. Made a proclamation. I fear God. Can you do the same thing this morning? Moses feared God. Exodus 18. But select capable men from all the people. What was one of his criteria? Men who fear God. Those are the kind of leaders that he chose. I wouldn't tell you who to vote for. Not my business. But one of the questions that I would ask, do they fear God? And get away from, I don't even do politics, but whatever you do in your life, whoever you associate with, all of life, you should be asking that question. Do they fear God? Do they fear God? David, Daniel, Abraham, others in the scripture, they all fear God. Jesus himself said, not, y'all remember the scripture, not to fear those who heal the body, but to Excuse me, but to only fear God, Matthew 10. And it's exactly what it says. Do not be afraid of those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, be afraid of the one who can destroy both body and soul in hell. So the young man feared God above the king. Their fear of God dictated their actions. How about you this morning? It will be the same for you and me. Now, Getting back to the scripture, then Nebuchadnezzar was filled with fury, and the expression of his face was changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He ordered the furnace heated seven times more than it was usually heated. Now, again, I'm asking, why do you think the king became so angry? Of course, his pride. He's got to exert control over those people. They must obey me. Just a matter of trivia, I was curious, so I looked at that furnace and did some research, and uh, equivalent to a kiln, somewhere between 1,600, depending on which commentary you read, and 3,000 degrees. Either one of them would be pretty hot. Um, <laughs> it wasn't hot enough. The king wanted it as hot as it would go. Verse 20, and he ordered some of the mighty men, and I'm out of time. We're going to have to stop right there. I'm sorry. Let's bow and pray. Father, thank you for the day and the blessings of it. Thank you for your people. Pray that you'll watch over them as they go, that you'll protect them, keep them and their families and their extended families. Father, please cover them with your wings. Keep them safe as only you can. For those who are sick, Father, this morning, we just ask that you'll come and have mercy and heal them <clears throat> according to your will. Father, for all things that you've given us, for how you have protected us and kept us, for your mercy and your goodness, Lord Jesus, for the hope of our salvation and for examples like these young men who feared you above all else we thank you we ask you please give us hearts that fear you in just such a way so that we'll live our lives father in a way that's pleasing to you ascribing all glory to you always and father we ask it all in the mighty name of jesus our lord and savior amen, amen. Lord.